This is a presentation on E. coli strain 0157H7 by John Gentry. So, why is E. coli an important bacteria? E. coli are considered the model organism of the bacterial world. A lot of research has been done to study this organism and its effects, especially after it was first recognized as pathogenic. E. coli is a foodborne pathogen responsible for 100,000 illnesses, 3,000 hospitalizations, and 90 deaths annually on average. E. coli contamination is a major issue for the beef industry. Every month it feels like there's a headline or a news article regarding the most recent E. coli outbreaks or announcing a major beef recall. This disease pathogen interrupts the ability for the industry to deliver a safe, wholesome food product. This negatively sways consumer perception and causes the consumer to not trust the packers. Overall, this drives consumers to other markets and decreases the demand for beef. Consumers place the blame on the industry. Beef traditionally has not been properly cooked to eliminate pathogens, such as chickens for example. Consumers need to understand how E. coli is transmitted and the importance of cooking the meat to the appropriate temperatures. In beef, the appropriate temperature is 160 degrees. Generic E. coli is a rod-shaped bacterium. Here in the picture, we see that the bacteria is covered in fimbrae, which are the hair-like structures that aid the bacteria in latching onto a surface. The bacteria also possesses several flagella, which aid the bacteria in movement through its environment. E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria, which means it does not retain the crystal violet stain used in gram staining method of bacterial cell differentiation. These cells are characterized by their cell envelopes, which are a thin peptidoglycan wall in between the cell membrane and the bacterial outer membrane. E. coli are a member of the bacterial group Enterobacteriaceae. Evolutionary related members of this group include pathogens Shigella, Salmonella, Citrobacter and Enterobacter. E. coli is an enteric bacterium, which means it resides in the gut of warm-blooded animals. The gut is the perfect environment for these bacteria, as it is rich in nutrients from digestion and absorption, and is also a completely separate environment from that of the host organism. There is a large degree of variation in DNA between the strains of E. coli, as evident by only 6% of the 15,741 gene families across 61 genomes being found in every genome. This allows E. coli to evolve rapidly and allows diversity and adaptivity to niches. This also means that non-pathogenic E. coli are highly susceptible to pick up genes that contain virulence factors. E. coli strain 0157H7 E. coli was first indicated to be pathogenic when it was isolated from an infant with diarrhea in the 1940s. Since then, strains of E. coli have been shown to have a role in intestinal and extraintestinal diseases. Among humans, a number of host-adapted pathogenic E. coli strains are recognized for gastrointestinal disease. Enteroinvasive E. coli, invasive diuretic strain similar to Shigella, Enteroaggregative E. coli that cluster in a stack pattern around the colonization sites, and diffuse adherent E. coli, which colonize a local area of the mucosa but are not clustered in a stack pattern. The specific E. coli strain 0157H7 is considered to be enterohemorrhagic bacteria, which means that these bacteria, when they're ingested, they lead to abdominal pain, diarrhea, and often bloody stools. These bacteria also allude to hemolytic uramic syndrome, which is a disease most common in children under 5 and elderly patients. HUS is caused by the abnormal destruction of red blood cells. Enterohemorrhagic E. coli enters the bloodstream after it is absorbed in the intestine, where it then travels and targets certain organs specifically the red blood cells. The increase of red blood cells that need digestion and reabsorption by the kidneys eventually leads to kidney failure. This syndrome is responsible for 
of kidney failure in kids younger than five years of age. So how does E. coli lead to the symptoms that it presents? After the consumption of food contaminated with E. coli 0157H7, the bacteria travel through the digestive system where they latch on to the mucosal epithelial cells of the large intestine. The bacteria then form a pedestal, which leads to destruction of microvilli in the large intestine. Once a pedestal has been formed, bacteria multiply, which leads to the production of more Shiga toxin, which induce vomiting in 50% of cases and fever in 30% of cases. The organism is required in very low concentrations to produce the symptoms, as less than 100 cells may be enough to cause an infection. So how does E. coli pertain to cattle? In cattle, most of the E. coli research has been limited to the total or generic E. coli concentration. E. coli was one of the few bacteria types isolated throughout the entire bovine gastrointestinal tract in early research, although now it has been shown that the total counts of bacteria can be highly variable between anatomical locations within the tract. Results indicate that generic E. coli composes 1% of the total culturable anaerobic bacteria. The majority of the bacteria accumulate at the recto-anal junction of the animal, as seen in the image to the right. The cow take, intakes enterohemorrhagic E. coli, where it travels throughout the gastrointestinal tract and eventually accumulates for shedding. E. coli 0157H7 has been proven to spread through the bovine feces. As many as 30% of feedlot cattle shed 0157H7. Fecal shedding is a pre-harvest hazard. When animals are moved to the feedlot, stress induces greater amounts of fecal shedding of E. coli. Unexposed animals are then able to ingest the, the pathogen and act as a reservoir until slaughter. Feces from themselves or other animals covers the hides of animals prior to the slaughter, and the direct contact of E. coli populations residing on the hide of the animal result in carcass contamination. So, how is the industry attempting to control E. coli concentrations? Bacterial shedding has been attempted to be controlled in several ways. The issue with control is that E. coli exists in the normal flora of the rumen. Research is beginning to understand how diet affects fecal shedding. Cattle fed a grain fed diet have been shown to have increased levels of E. coli present. On the other hand, cattle fed a hay based diet have been shown longevity of shedding compared to grain based diets. To reduce fecal contamination pre harvest, the industry is looking for a form of multi level control. How the animal is managed has been shown to affect levels of E. coli contamination within the herd. Pre-harvest control is broken down into management and transportation, cattle water and feed management, and live animal treatment. Overall, these pre-harvest practices only limit exposure, and the multi-level control includes the proper sanitation and care during carcass dressing to effectively control E. coli contamination. Research has also shown that the use of antibiotics, probiotics, and vaccinations have had some success in reducing fecal sh shedding, but much is still not understood and is a hot topic for research today.